This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. Daniel constantly confronts us with the question, whose kingdom are you really building? Not whose kingdom do you say you're building, but whose kingdom are you really building? Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me want to dance and sing with every single breath I breathe. I will break this offering. You are my wonder. You bring the wonder. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Hello and welcome. This is Today with Jeff Vines. And in this message, Daniel interprets the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar as symbolising the coming of a kingdom from outside of this world that would not be overthrown. When he explains another dream that means the king is headed for ruin, is it enough for the king to finally turn to God as the giver of all good things? Here's Pastor Jeff to begin the message. Now, let me ask a question for, for you. Anybody ever had a reoccurring dream? Just uh, remember when you were younger or even still today, raise your hands high. Just so I, yeah, I'm talking about when you have a genuine dream, a dream uh, that just kind of comes back and again and again. When I was eight years old, I had a reoccurring dream of being chased around a racetrack by the devil. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I thought it was a spiritual metaphor until I realized the devil looked an awful lot like my grandmother. Now you... My, you have to know my grandmother, she was pretty mean. So, you know, that, you know, so I still think there was some kind of metaphor there, but I don't know if you've noticed, but in this series that we've been in the book of Daniel, there's a, there's a lot of dreaming going on and dreams played a vital role in ancient culture, still in today's cultures, just maybe not the West as much as it should, but ancient cultures put a lot of stock in dreams and King Nebuchadnezzar as we come to Daniel 4, is going to have another dream. And every time he has a dream, he calls together the wise men of Babylon to come and interpret the dream for him. And he's so angry, back in chapter 2, when they can interpret the dream or identify the dream, that he wants to kill them all. And he would have exterminated all of them had it not been for Daniel. And Daniel's saying, wait a minute, king, don't do something so rash. Uh, Let me come and talk to you, and maybe the God, the one God, the one God will be able to interpret the dream." And so we're learning through this whole series, we need to ask the question, how do we live as Christ followers in a world that is not especially sympathetic to Christians? And we looked at Daniel, we are looking at Daniel because that's the question he's asking. They're in captivity, they're in Babylon, they're in exile, and they're in a polytheistic world, multi-gods, and they are monotheists, they believe in one God. And so we're told through the story that God actually sent Daniel into exile for this purpose to interpret the king's dream that the king might come to know the one true God. So back in chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a huge statue with a a head of pure gold and chest and arms of silver and belly and thighs of bronze and legs of iron and feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And then all of a sudden in this dream, a little rock not made with hands strikes the statue, knocks it down, and then a little stone grows into the huge mountain. We've said Daniel is trying to relate to the king that there is a kingdom that will come from outside of humanity that will destroy all kingdoms and that will reign forever. There's only one kingdom that lasts forever. And that's what we've seen so far, right? And that kingdom is in the heart and minds of every believer right now. So it's here, but not yet. But one day it becomes a reality and it's a kingdom that will last forever. And the people who really get into that kingdom, they, and here's a, a great way to know that you're in, is you have a centralized joy. Even though your life can be falling apart and some lives do at some point, we all hit that time in life when it's not fun, but there's still a centralized joy in you and it's because you know that you're part of something that is gonna last forever. That's how you know. That's how you know that there's something real that's in you. And so Daniel constantly confronts us with the question, whose kingdom are you really building? Not whose kingdom do you say you're building, but 
Whose kingdom are you really building? Your life, does it model the fact that you are primarily interested in building the kingdom of God or do you just talk a good game? And so, so now we come to chapter four. And in chapter four, guess what the king does? He's got another dream. And he calls the wise men together. And Daniel ends up at the doorstep again. And he listens as the king tells him the dream. Now, I'm going to kind of summarize it, but I will have certain passages. But here's what happens. He says, I had a dream, and it made me afraid. I was lying on my bed. And the images and visions, they terrified me. Because I looked up, and there before me stood this huge tree in the middle of the land. It was an enormous tree of, of enormous height. It grew large and strong. Its top touched the very top of the sky. It was visible to all the earth. The leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant. And on it was food for all. And all the wild animals found shelter under it. And all the birds uh, would nest in its branches. And it had food to feed everyone. And then he says, in the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one, a messenger, coming down out of heaven. And he calls out in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it, the birds from its branches, but leave the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze. Let those things remain in the ground as the grass in the field. And then whoever this dream represents or whatever it represents gets some pretty harsh words in verse 15 or at least the second part of it. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let it be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. And then Daniel says, now think about it. You know, the whole thing, don't shoot the messenger. Daniel's now got to give the king bad news. He says, king, you know that tree you saw, that large tree that gets chopped down? Dude, that's you. You're the tree. You're about to get chopped down. Yeah, you've become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it is noticed by distant parts of the land. It reaches to the top of the sky. But then you saw the Holy One, the messenger coming down from heaven that said, cut down that tree, destroy it, leave the stump though. Let him be drenched with the dew of, the, of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals like the plants of the field that seven times passed before him. And Daniel says, your majesty, this is the decree that's come from the most high. You've made your decrees, King Nebuchadnezzar, but there's another king that's higher and more mighty. And he says, you're going to be driven away. You're going to be driven away from people. You're going to live with the wild animals. You're going to eat grass like an ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. But he says, King, you know, the messenger says, leave the stump. In other words, give the king a chance to repent. And he says, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. A sure sign that you've been transformed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. Now, here's what's interesting. You read in chapter 4, and all of this happens. Twelve months later, the king is walking out on the roof of the palace. Now, you would think that you know Daniel is very good at dream interpretation. He's batting a thousand. Nobody bats a thousand. He gets it right every time. King Nebuchadnezzar's even acknowledged that Daniel's God is the one true God. And if anybody says anything about Daniel's God, then they're going to be turns into piles of rubble, right? <laughs> he loves that piles of rubble thing. So why doesn't Nebuchadnezzar catch himself? Instead, in verse 29, is this not the Babylon, the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Dude, you just had a dream 11 months ago. And the words were barely off his lips. When the Bible says his royal authority was taken from him, he was driven away from the people. He lived as a wild animal. He ate grass like an ox. And again, verse 32 told us that seven times will pass until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. 
Okay, let's do some multiple choice. Let's see how smart you are so far in the book of Daniel. First question, chapter four of the book of Daniel teaches us, A, Nebuchadnezzar should have killed all the wise men the first time around. B, Nebuchadnezzar sleeps way too much and needs to get a real job. C, if you feel that you've accomplished something great, keep it to yourself. D, God gives the kingdom of men to those who are really gifted and smart, or E, none of the above. What do you think? I'm going with E. I can't believe some of you pause there. You're just so scared. <laughs> Second question, chapter four of the book of Daniel teaches us, A, wealth can be replaced with poverty in a matter of seconds. B, all wealth ultimately belongs to God. C, people with genuine gratitude become generous. D, God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Or E, all of the above. Now that's E, all of the above. You're doing well, batting a thousand. Daniel 4, the point that Daniel 4 makes is that God gives the kingdoms of men to whomever he chooses. That's God's way of reminding Nebuchadnezzar, everything you have belongs to me. It's on loan to you. Be thankful. Now, after all that, you might say, what's the impact of all that on my life? Okay, now we got some questions and you can answer out loud if you're brave. Most of you in this room have built a pretty good life. I can guarantee you that every child on this stage would love to have your life. See, you're, you're busy comparing it with everybody else. But I guarantee that these kids would have loved to have had your life and have it right now. In fact, I can tell you that close to two-thirds of the world wish they had your life. Wish they had the problems you had. So here's my question. Think about all the good that you have in your life. And if you can't do that, you've got another problem. That's another sermon. Who is truly responsible for any good stuff in your life? I mean, love, relationships, nature, everything. Who gave you any skill that you have? Who gave you? See, some people will say to me, well, I, I work hard. I've earned it all. Wait a minute. Who gave you your skills and work ethic? God. Who blesses your efforts? God. So everything trace back ultimately to God. Now, the question comes, does that mean if I struggle financially that God is cursing me? What if you're in the room and you don't know where your next meal's coming from and you don't have a, a roof over your head? What then? All right, let me think about this just for a moment. This is going to be hard for you to hear and it's not preached very often. You do realize God owes you nothing, right? You got that. You're not owed anything. Your very life is a gift. God breathed life into you. So it's not like you put me here, you got to make me wealthy. Success in life is not measured by wealth, right? There are many older people like myself in this room that know that if you pursue wealth all of your life, you're just going to be miserable because you're never going to have enough. But that's not how you define success anyway. Third, there could be cause and effect involved in the situation that you're in right now. This is a fallen world. The Bible tells us time and time again, there is a prince of the power of the air. There are two kingdoms in operation, diametrically opposed. Keep praying, keep seeking. But many of us, the bad things that happen in our life are the result of decisions other people make that impact us. Now, fourth, the reality is that all of you are far more rich than you know. And I'm just not talking about spiritual wealth. 800 million people will not eat today. 800 million 300 million of those will be children. Most of us have so much food in our house. It's amazing, I've seen this. We actually will take the old food out of the fridge to make room for the new food to go in. In fact, you and I are so privileged, we can go to food warehouses called grocery stores. And at this point, life becomes so difficult, the tension that comes in, because we not only get to choose from food, we get different kinds of the same food. So while most of the world doesn't have bread, we go into the bread aisle and we have to choose. Do we want wheat or full grain or multigrain or seed inflicted or white bread or sourdough or even something called Old Testament bread, Ezekiel bread? And it's, it's also exhausting, which explains why rich people engage in another activity. Do you know that they will actually leave their home a few times a week and have somebody else prepare their meals for them? And they will go out to something called a restaurant and, and other people will make their food for them. That way, if there's no food in the house that is desirable, even though there's so much, each can choose 
what he or she wants. And unlike one billion people, one billion people in the world who do not have access to drinking water, rich people have to struggle with the decision over what flavor they want their water to be. Fruit flavor, artificial flavor, bubbles and non-bubbles. They have so much expendable income in view of the rest of the people of the world that they will they'll hardly ever drink out of the tap. The tap. They'll pay money to have somebody put the same water in a bottle. And women in these rich families, I, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, they will stand in front of the closet. And I, I've, never, I've never seen this myself personally, but I've heard this happens. <laughs> they will stand in front of their closet and they will say, with, with clothes everywhere and shoes everywhere, they will say, I have absolutely nothing to wear. <laughs> when, when most of the world would, would think that you're so wealthy, most people wear the same clothes every day. While they're doing that, their husbands are down in the garage. While hundreds of millions of people would give anything for a house with a roof over their heads, rich people, they keep their cars in little houses. Their cars have better houses than two-thirds of the rest of the world. And what's shocking is the guy will go down into the garage and he'll start looking at his car and he'll say, I need a new car. Now the car runs just fine. It may have a dent or two. It might, might not be as nice as their neighbors, but it works just fine. So while 92%, 92% of the world would give anything to have a car, he says, I got to have another one. Now, I know that was a little sarcastic and that uh, I'm not usually that bad, but I guess I, I, I've uh, been convicted by my own message. A few years ago, I was at International Conference on Missions and a guy from Nairobi Chapel named Oscar Murray began to preach. He talked about how God is building a global tapestry, but he started moving through the map of the world. And he started with Europe and he says, if you think how, think about Europe's contribution, the philosophers, the thinkers, the artists, the Oxfords, the Da Vinci's, the cathedrals, the George Whitfields and Jonathan Edwards and later on Martin Lloyd Joneses, they've delivered some of the greatest Christian thinkers and hymn writers and builders and preachers. And Europe with all of its issues, there can be no doubt that Europe has made significant contributions to Christendom and continues to do so. And then he moved across the map to Africa. And he started talking about the African Christians. They are resolute, resourceful. They possess a first century type of Christianity that features a singularity that lives every single day with a desperate dependence on God for survival. They live hand to mouth, hand to mouth, depending totally on where they're on God, where their next food, next meal is going to come from. And yet they're singing and dancing and worship and passion for God. And their overall joyous expression puts we who have everything to shame. And then he moved over to India. The all or nothing type Christian lives here, he said, who considers it a privilege to suffer, even die, for the cause of Jesus Christ. Yes, the tears come, but they come with an overall inward joy that is unexplainable to the rest of us Christians in the world. They know the world has nothing truly to offer them. Their hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. They die daily for the cause of Christ. And then he moved over to Asia. These Christians from this continent are wholeheartedly committed. They seek purity of body and soul more passionately than any other Christian group. And they strive hard to win the battles over the addictions and sins that they are tangled in their lives. And for them, they are committed and they are diligent. Church attendance is a non-negotiable. They wouldn't dream about doing anything but being in church on the Lord's day. They are supremely committed and diligent to their faith and beliefs. And then he moved over to America. And he said, what have the Americans offered us? Now, as an American, I started getting a little mad until I heard what he was doing and where he was going. He said, what role do the Christians in America play? What are they called upon to model to the rest of the world? One third of the world's wealth resides in one country, the United States of America. And the reason there's so much money in America is because, ah, God, God, who gave you the wealth that you have in your lives? And do you have the wealth, A, because you're good and you've earned it, B, because you're his favorite, C, because he really dislikes everyone else, or D, none of the above? The question is, 
Why has God blessed America with so many resources? And you should hear this pastor, this world-changing pastor, say basically this. America is loved by God like every other country. And the calling on the lives of American Christians is to fund the spreading of the gospel throughout the world where others do not have the resources to do so. That's the call on our lives. To whom much is given, much is required. The Indian Christian has given us courage. You're not being asked to die for your faith. The African Christian has given us a resourcefulness to do much with very little. You've not been asked to do that. The Asian Christian has given us the gift of compelling sanctification, a contagious search for holiness and purity. We've been asked to do that, but so often our money tempts us in the other direction. What about us? What is our calling? To resource all of them. To resource them. And then Oscar, Oscar Muir stood up after the end of his message and he said this, the call and the gift that God has given America is one third of the world's wealth. Christians in America are the wealthiest by far on planet earth. Your calling, your job is to resource those who can't take the gospel into places that are isolated. Stop asking us to beg you for them. Stop making us beg you for these resources when it is God who's given them to you. Our calling is to first change our community and then the rest of the world. First at home and then the rest of the world. God orchestrates relationships. We can't possibly be responsible for every need in the world. So we are responsible for the doors that God opens for us here and now. So my friend Denver Chizanga is here from Zimbabwe. Denver Chizanga has done more for evangelism in the central southern part of Africa than anybody I know. And he's trying desperately to build a training center to train pastors to continue to send them out to complete the third tier of evangelism on the continent of Africa. He's very gifted. God has brought him to us. He's depending on us. We made a commitment that we're going to help him build this training center so that we can train pastors to go out into the northern areas, into the Muslim world that you and I could probably never go into. Why did we choose this? Because God orchestrated and fashioned together a relationship. Why are we connected with Ajay Lal in India? Because 75% of the rest of the people who are unchurched on planet earth live on those northern borders. God brought us together. We're trying to resource those pastors as they're willing to die for the cause of Christ and go into those bordered areas. But they have to be resourced. You and I have been gifted with resources. They've been gifted with the passion to give their lives, even if it means their death, for the cause of Christ. Now, which one would you rather do, die or fund it? Well, God has gifted you to fund it. He's gifted them to die. It is a gift. And then Nairobi, Kenya, Stella, she's trying to save one slum area. We can't save them all, but God has brought Stella in our lives to build this high school education center so that we can save at least one slum on our watch and give children a hope and a future like the children you saw on the stage. And in the South Pacific, my friend Clive Raharui, that's just a crazy man, he's not gonna rest until the most remote places in the South Pacific have heard the good news of the gospel. And we've committed to all of these to make sure that we're accomplishing them. And I, I thank you for your generosity, but we have to keep our commitment globally to our overseas partners in order that they may continue to take the gospel to the world. And I really want to encourage you, God has gifted you with resources. How are you using them? Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that we could be part of something this weekend. Well, I think of what's going on just across our border into Mexico and home builders and Denford and Zimbabwe and Ajay and India and Stella and Nairobi and Clive down in the South Pacific. And I pray that our eyes would be open today to how much wealth we really have, but we would also recognize the calling of God on our lives to build something other than our own personal kingdom. In Christ's name, everybody said, amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts.
Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.